And uh, I already mentioned in one of my early transparencies this important person, Aristotle. He was important for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that he began sort of a scientific process where he liked to categorize things, put them in some particular order. Science has all to do with order. He did this a lot with animals and all kinds of things. Aristotle, as it turns out, is also very important for another reason, and it might surprise you, he's important for his extremely bad physics. <laughs> and when you think about it, it's not that I'm calling him names or anything like dumb, but the physics that he came up with, you might argue was sort of the best that, that uh, you could come up, up with at the time. And of course, they might be say the same thing about our Nobel Prize winners someday in the far future. But Aristotle's physics theories were very successful in the sense that people, they sounded logical, they depended on reasoning, and so he convinced people that they were right. And it took a long time to get past, past this. And so, sort of in the Western world, after the Greeks went away, we had the Romans and all the other things, uh, we came upon the Dark Ages, and scientific progress stalled. And there's a, I should, there's a caveat to this. It didn't stall completely, because this refers to the Western world. In the Islamic world, mathematics and science was picked up they knew what the Greeks had taught, and they carried it on. And so there was progress made during that time, in fact, some important progress. But as far as Europe and the Western world were concerned, this was basically the rule. Uh, there were scientific theories and ideas, such as Aristotle's, that were not put to the test during that time, and so they were just accepted, and uh, there was no progress made. It's very important to know that science makes progress by making a theory and then a bunch of experimentalists such as myself set out to prove that it's wrong. Sometimes people have different ideas of what scientists do, but for a person like me, to, show, to do an experiment that shows some theory is complete bunk is uh, the best way that I can make my career progress. So, Bottom line is all scientific theories reflect the truth only to the, within the limits that they work. And that means that we expect to replace them all eventually be, until we learn everything. And then once we know everything, I'm not sure what we do at that point, but we won't go into that. But we expect to come up with better and better, better theories all the time. So that's what we work at. Now this is a story of an interesting theory because, as you recall from your classes back in the Dark Ages, people still tended to believe, at least at the beginning, that the sun revolved around the earth and all of that. And they had a very elaborate, uh, nice mathematical model for that developed by Ptolemy. And it worked pretty well for predicting things. And then this upstart got this better <laughs> idea because it seemed more philosophically sound to him that uh, the Earth and the other planets were going around the Sun instead of vice versa. So he put this theory forward, which was a very dangerous thing to do at, at that time, and it was put to the scientific test, and it failed. People kept using the old theory. Yes? I thought it was Galileo that came up with the of centuries. This is before Copernicus was before Galileo, and he's the first the first one that had the idea. It is, and, and the question, does anyone know why uh, Copernicus' idea failed? And why people didn't start using it? It was much easier to understand mathematically, and so on. There's, well, it, the church, independent of the church, the church didn't like this idea. That's certainly true. But people who might have liked this idea and tried to test it found out that it didn't work. And it didn't work because he used circles for the orbits instead of ellipses. Okay, that's exactly right. If you didn't, if you didn't hear the answer, 
Copernicus had a very nice symmetrical theory that used circles for the orbits of the planets and so on, and that wasn't right. The orbits were ellipses. So when you actually tried to do calculations, you got the wrong answers. So it wasn't very good theory for predicting things. But then a guy named Kepler came along and figured out that, that the planets were actually moving in ellipses, and he uh, made up some rules for how that worked. And people started making big progress after that. Galileo was a, a very important person in the development of not only the, the what was going on in the solar system, he invented the telescope, looked at, through the telescope, saw the moons revolving around Jupiter, which seemed to indicate that this uh, new theory of the solar system was probably right. He also formulated the basic laws of falling uh, bodies and, and uh, all of those sorts of things. And as, and as you know, Galileo got, Galileo got into a lot of trouble with the church. So it was dangerous to be uh, a scientist or a physicist in those days. As time went on, a little bit after Galileo, Newton came along, and he was the first true astrophysics in the sense astrophysicist in the sense that we have astrophysicists here at the lab today. Uh, the story goes, of course, which probably isn't true, that he was sitting in the orchard and saw an apple fall and figured it all out from that. Um, that's probably a little oversimplified, but what he did do was he made the connection between falling bodies on the Earth, or physical laws on the Earth, and the moon and things he saw in space. So he was able to formulate the law of gravity and the laws of motion. And in the process of doing that, he had to invent calculus. It turns out he invented calculus at the same time as another person named Leibniz. And we use, we don't use Newton's version and notation. We use the other one. But this man was truly a genius. Did he have it all right? Of course, we know that he didn't, but uh, we can't go back and, and give him an F on the test now. Uh, this man came along, and with the little transformation that I told you about earlier, came up with a special theory of relativity that we've already talked about. This particular theory is very comprehensible if you read about it. And you can get the twin paradox out of it, things I talked about. And an even more, uh, more monumental theory that he came up with is the general theory of relativity, which did make the connection between space-time and mass or matter. In fact, the basic idea of the general theory of relativity is that matter sitting in space deforms the space so that things don't appear to go in straight lines. But they really do go in straight lines as far as the space is concerned. It's just that space itself is curved. And this theory had remarkable success. It was first tested by viewing starlight coming past the sun during an eclipse and seeing that the star appeared to be in the wrong place and as it was bent around the sun. Now that's a little unfair because Newton's theory predicted also that light would be bent but by a different different amount. So the theory was successful. Turns out the experiment was wrong probably, but it was right. They got the right answer for the wrong reasons. That's the way science goes a lot of times. And this man became very famous. At the same time that he was working on special theory of relativity, he was also working on something called the photoelectric effect. And one of the outcomes of, of that paper that he wrote in 1905, along with the special theory of relativity, and I think there were four other papers, that any one of which any physicist would love to have in his publication list. But the photoelectric effect was important. People were beginning to learn at that time that matter behaved very strangely when you got down to very small sizes. And so quantum mechanics uh, was the outcome of all of that effort. And quantum mechanics 
dealt in probabilities, and you'll have a whole lecture on quantum mechanics, but Albert Einstein never liked quantum mechanics, and he did not want to accept it until the day he died, but he never successfully worked his way around it. Anyway, the net outcome of all of this was the, we lost the notion that time was absolute, and that space was absolute, and that's supposed to re be reflected in that dollar painting. Same time experimentalists were starting to make big progress in understanding the very tiny things, and that went something like this. The Curies, back during the 19th century, discovered that some of the chemical elements seem to transform themselves by emitting some form of radiation that uh, they studied. And chemistry had been able to determine that there were atoms going all the way back to Democritus, or so they thought. They thought what they had found was indivisible and so on. Well, the Curies got the first clue that those atoms might be visible because they seemed to be coming apart and turning into other things. This was dangerous work. I think they both died of cancer. And then right at the end of the 19th century, J.J. Thompson was playing around with, uh, with a cathode ray tube, and he put a voltage across here, and he could get a beam, a beam in there that he could see, and he could deflect that beam with a magnet, and uh, he ended up discovering the electron, which is the first of the truly fundamental particles, as far as we know, that was discovered. And it's interesting that he didn't have much idea of what the impact of his discovery would be, and if you'd ask him, he would have thought nothing. But, you know, this is a prototype of your television tube, and understanding the electron and electronics combined with quantum mechanics that I'll tell you about in a moment has led to both, most of our gross national product these days. So this was an important discovery. We still didn't know much about the atoms. We knew they were coming up apart, and there was a brilliant physicist from New Zealand who was working, he was working in England at the time, and he's credited with the discovery of the nucleus. And so I'm going to show you how simple it was to discover that the atoms were made out of something with a hard little kernel inside all the nucleus. And so what I'm going to show you is the basic principle of what we still do here today. To make this discovery, he, he took a gold foil, which I've drawn as a cube, because I always got bad grades in art, and he got a radioactive source that was basically made of alpha particles, and he shined his alpha particle source on this gold foil, and he found that most of the particles went right through the foil without being deflected. But some of them would come back and scatter at a large angle where he had detectors so he could see this happening. And so he had thought the atoms might be some kind of smush that would affect the particles somehow, sort of uniformly. But what he found was that most of them went right through the foil, but a few really got the, the dickens knocked out of them when they tried to get through and came bouncing back. From that, he concluded that there was a little, relatively small, hard kernel in the middle of each atom that would re deflect these particles, and that turned out to be the nucleus. So the idea of shooting a beam of particles at something to find out about it uh, might be new to you, but I'm going to make, try to make you comfortable with it. Uh, at the time, people used natural radioactive sources like Rutherford did to get his, his particles, but people also noticed that you could take a, a charged particle like Thompson did, put a voltage between two plates, say, and you could accelerate the charged particle between the plates. So in doing that, you can make a beam. Put a hole in the plate, say, and the particle comes out the other side, and now you've got a beam uh, of particles that you can shine on things, and we'll talk about how you learn things from that in a minute. I'm going to skip all the way up to the 1930s now, where uh, Ernest Lawrence enters the picture, because he was good at making beams. In fact, he invented one of the most important uh, ways of making a beam that we have. We still use 
his general principal today. He was from South Dakota, and he was ended up at, at Berkeley, and he invented the first cyclotron, which was about this big around. I can't remember if I have a photograph. Probably not. But uh, anyway, the cyclotron made use of the fact that uh, you could use one small voltage and pass the particles through it many times, and if you phased the voltage right so that it was always the right direction when the particles passed through, you would get an acceleration. And so that became a good source of particle beams, but you could still only accelerate the particles to a few million volts. And what that means is an electron volt is the amount of energy that an electron gets when it falls through one volt. And already physicists were beginning to understand, I'll explain why in a minute, that they wanted these beams to have high energies, millions of volts, or jillions of volts, like we do now. And we'll, we'll see why. Anyway, uh, Lawrence was born in 1901. I already did the punchline here. Uh, you should remember Marilyn and Carolyn's birthday. Lawrence is definitely older than Marilyn and Carolyn. So that's when he was born. And he's credited with inventing the cyclotron, Nobel Prize winner. And he was the thesis advisor of our first director here, who worked with him in his laboratory at Berkeley. I'll tell you more about that later. Once you saw that an important part of Rutherford's experiment was being able to detect those alpha particles they ricochet back somewhere. So you need to measure the angle and what they're doing. And so you'll have a whole lecture on the detectors we use to see these tiny fundamental particles in physics. I'll, I've just listed some of the things here, ranging from Geiger counters, which basically just measure radiation, scintillation counters. These things work primarily by using, in many cases, a gas, such as a Geiger counter. And when a charged particle passes through the gas and knocks some of the electrons off the atoms, and so when you have a voltage across that gas, the ions tend to go one way and the electrons tend to go the other way. And if you collect those on two plates, you get a current pulse out. So that tells you the charged particle went through. Some of the other counters depend on the atoms being excited. Scintillators are plastic, clear plastic. Particle goes through, they excite higher states in the atoms by moving the electrons up to higher energy states, and then those atoms decay back to the lower states and they give off light when they do that. And you see that, you pick that up in a photomultiplier tube that you'll learn how that works, and you detect uh, particles. There are things like cloud chambers and bubble chambers, where you have a superheated liquid, particles pass through that liquid when it's superheated, they ionize some of the liquid, and it causes the gas to boil along the path of the particles. So you see tracks there. Wire chambers work like Geiger counters, except you keep careful track of uh, where the particle goes through so you can get a uh, trajectory. And then there are things, Cherenkov counters, I'll just say this to make you curious, but they work on the principle that you pass the particle through a medium where the speed of light is lower. If you, and you can ask me this in between times, how can the speed of light ever be lower? But if you pass light through a piece of glass, for example, the speed of light is slower in the glass than it is in, in air. So the particles can actually go through the glass faster than the speed of light. And what happens is you get uh, a sonic boom only in light. So you get this cone of light coming out, just like you do sound waves from a jet going faster than the speed of light. You can detect that cone of light and see what your particles are. So those are the kind of detectors you'll learn a lot more about. This is just an old photo of a bubble chamber where particles were passing through here. I think there was an event right here that a neutral particle came in and then these charged particles went out. They're bent in a magnetic field and the paths that you see there are uh, uh, where the liquid in the bubble chamber, which was probably hydrogen in this case, is boiling. If you want to see this chamber, 15-foot chamber, it's set up outside like a sculpture out at the end of the beam lines now. We used to have it installed where, where it actually worked, and 
and Saturday morning physics kids got to climb around on top of it and see the big cameras and so on. Now you can see it, but you can't climb around them. Okay, so just a reminder, this is what we're doing, and I've just introduced uh, these important items here, accelerators and detectors, because they're important in how we're going to learn things. And so there's another important factor here that we haven't talked a lot about. And I, I told you I, I had not uh, discussed what an event was, but we know that things interact. In other words, I can touch this thing and I can make it go different ways. And you have to understand how that happens. That happens in space-time. We can take stuff, move it around, accelerate it, and things like that. And that's where the forces come in. And, of course, causality can never be overlooked. Because once we do overlook it, we're in a lot of trouble. So there are four forces that we know about. Gravity is the weakest one. When you climb the stairs here, it seems like the strongest one, but believe me, it isn't. <laughs> then there's the weak force that has to do with a lot of the radioactive decay and so on. And these things all fit in in different ways to the way the world works. There's the electromagnetic force. I say it runs your hair dryer because it has to do with electricity and magnetism. It's also what keeps you from just zipping through the floor, right through the floor. It means what makes things solid because it binds all the atoms, molecules, and things together so that I can't just push my hand through this thing. And, uh, so it's a very important force. And then, then there's a strong force that you don't have much experience with, except that without it, the nuclei that make you up wouldn't hold together and you'd be gone before you even exist. And so the question is why are there different forces? And are they really different? And it turns out that we think we know realms in the universe where they're not. And, uh, and we'll get back into the, the business of time with those forces. This is the way uh, physicists like to represent this, these forces. They draw these pictures, which this is the electromagnetic force, for example. Let me put everything up here. This is the weak force. We draw all the forces this way. These are called Feynman diagrams. And these diagrams are actually a tricky way that lift, allow you to do a complicated integral in calculus and calculate the coupling constants. So you can calculate, use this picture to calculate exactly what this picture and a bunch to go with it, exactly the strength of that force and so on. We like to think of the electromagnetic force, for example. You have an electron coming in. It scatters off of a proton that comes in. They both go off in different directions, and we say that happens because a photon is exchanged. A photon is just a particle of light or electromagnetic radiation. And this theory that you can draw this this way and do the calculation as if that's what happened works extremely well. Electrodynamic, quantum electrodynamics is the most precise theory that we've ever stumbled upon, and it's been tested to great detail. And the same sort of pictures work for the other forces, but we don't, we can't calculate them nearly so precisely. So now I've started talking about quantum electrodynamics, or sort of been edging up to the subject of quantum mechanics. So let me try to give you an idea of quantum mechanics and to give you an idea of how successful I'll be. Quantum mechanics is one of those things that when I first learned it, I rebelled against it and didn't like it. It took me about 40 years to get used to it or something. And uh, finally, I'm beginning to think it's, it's okay and it's really the right thing to do. Einstein never liked it. But the surprising thing about quantum mechanics are things like this. If you shine a beam of light on two slits so that the waves then come out from the slits in these spherical, supposed to be spherical bands, what you find out if you put a screen over here is that you have light light and dark areas, depending on how the waves arrive at this point, whether the waves are adding up or, or canceling one another. So you get what looks like a diffraction pattern. And this shouldn't surprise any of you too much. This, this happens. You may not have seen it. And with light, we all used to think of light as waves and so on. And uh, so it works. Now suppose we replace 
this light beam with a beam of electrons. What quantum mechanics has told us is that there's a wavelength associated with all matter, including electrons, that's given by this fundamental constant of nature divided by the momentum. So if you want to change the wavelength, you change the momentum since uh, we're not allowed to change the fundamental constants. So if you shine the electrons on these two slits, what do you expect to happen? Well, it turns out, not surprisingly, that the same thing happens. You get a diffraction pattern here. So these electrons that we think of as particles are really behaving like waves and showing up as this pattern. So then you ask, well, we can put a stop to that. Suppose we just let one electron at a time go through there. Then it cannot interfere with anything and uh, we shine a very low intensity electron beam on the screen and one electron hits here every hour and when we add it all up in the end what do we see? The wave. To our consternation we get this pattern. And the only way you can imagine getting this pattern, well there may be other ways, but one way you can imagine it is if the, the electron somehow went through both holes at once. So it interfered with itself. So it ended up making this pattern. So then you say, well, I don't like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow these electrons one at a time and make sure I know which hole they went through and see that they didn't go through the other hole at the same time. So you put a little detector here that uh, tries to, goes off when an electron passes by so you know it went through that hole. If it doesn't go through this hole, you know it went through that hole. So you can keep track of where every electron goes. When you do this, what do you get? Well, again, to your consternation, you find out that this diffraction pattern has disappeared. So checking up on the electron makes it behave. You know, it's sort of like when your mother checks up on you for cleaning your room or something. It's real, real stern with you. Then you behave right. But when the electrons are not checked on to make a diffraction pattern. This is quantum mechanics. It makes you very angry. <laughs> so people thought about this a lot and tried to understand how this could be. And it forced people to come up with the notion of wave functions to describe particles, which are basically waves. And the fact, the uncertainty principle plays a role here. I don't have to to you, but it turns out you can only measure uh, a particle's momentum and position to a certain accuracy at any one time. And it turns out if you if you uh, put your detector here, you violate that principle and you change the outcome of the experiment. So this is sort of a fascinating thing and it takes a long time to get used to. But the bottom line there, for what I'm going to tell you, is that every particle in the universe, every bit of mass has this wave function associated with it, so it behaves like a wave. So what do we do here at Fermilab? We're trying to learn, just like Rutherford did, what the protons now are made up of, what's deep down inside. We're trying to get to the heart of the problem. And so we're going to shine a beam of light onto some object, and suppose there are things inside of it that we want to learn something about. Imagine this is a proton, and we want to learn about the internal structure. And so we want to do Rutherford's experiment where we send things and see if we get this situation. Things bounce off hard scattering. And we have to keep this in mind, quantum mechanics, that our wavelength uh, goes like H Planck's constant over momentum. So if you shine a long wavelength light on here, where long is long compared to the size of this object, I think intuitively you can see, and I'm just trying to give you an intuitive feel now, that what will happen here is that this wave will interact with this whole object, may move it somewhere, but you're not going to learn a lot about what goes on in there. If on the other hand, you change this wavelength of your beam so that you're looking at a very short wavelength object, then you see you have a chance of interacting with just one of the constituents, wherever they are, and you learn something about what's in there. So now it's time to go back to our our experiment on how we see things and see what that means in terms of trying to see inside of a proton. So as you recall, 
we started out with an object hidden inside a box, shined a flashlight, and by some miracle we see that there's a soccer ball in there. What we're going to do here at Fermilab is we're going to make a target made out of protons, whatever, some substance, and we want to see deep inside not only the nucleus but the protons in there. And we know now that this wavelength of our flashlight is probably too long to see the details that we want. So we replace our buck 385 flashlight with an accelerator that costs, you know, the order of a billion dollars. <laughs> the government didn't like to hear that. <laughs> we shine our beam on the target and what happens is exactly the same thing. Particles scatter out in all directions. We pick up some of them in a detector that we have set off to the side. This is the way we used to do our research here. A fixed target, the beam from the accelerator. That detector uh, gathers information about these particles that are coming into it, and it's transmitted into a computer. Your computer, the computer does a complicated analysis, and you know what's in there. Now that doesn't sound like this so much because you're used to seeing things, but this is not just an analogy. This is exactly what we do and what happens here at the lab. What we've learned to do that makes this a little bit more confusing is because we want this wavelength, which I'll write down here again, to be as small as possible. And we're always learning new tricks. So some time ago we learned that if we took our target and got it moving in the accelerator in the other direction, so we take our one beam going this way and the other beam going the other way and collide them, then we effectively make this wavelength even much smaller. So that's the way our collider works. We put protons into the big tevatron going in one direction. We put antiprotons or antimatter, which we haven't talked about yet, I'll talk about it in a minute, going the other direction. And we collide them and we can see deep within the protons so that we think we know what's going on in there and I'll explain what we think we see in a minute. Let me go back for just a moment, since I just mentioned antimatter and mentioned an important guy who started out being practical in his life uh, by studying electrical engineering. His, uh, his uh, father was Swiss and his mother was English. That's the way it goes. And he was born one year after Ernest Lawrence August 8th. Coincidence? I don't think so. <laughs> Marilyn has never quite lived up to the rack. I hold that, hold that over all the time. Anyway, the rack, by that time quantum mechanics was going strong. But there, there was this other problem that we had special relativity also going on. And the wave function that Schrodinger had come up with, he was an Austrian and Heisenberg had formulated in a different way, did not seem to work in a picture where you had relativity. So Dirac, brilliant young person studying physics at Cambridge, and one weekend in the winter, all his friends went off skiing to Switzerland and left him alone, which they should have never done because when he was alone, his mind got very powerful. And he came up with the Dirac equation, which I've written there, and you can just look at it written in an extremely simple form there, which uh, you'll, I'm not sure you'll get this again in here, but it, it basically governs quantum mechanics and it accounts for electrons and so on. And I just put this quote from Dirac there because I like the way he thought, which has nothing to do with the lecture. In any case, Dirac's equation had this very strange property. Like all equations in mathematics, we talked about this, we talked a little at the break. Mathematics, you can come up with mathematics that seems to describe the real world. You can also come up with mathematics that seems to have nothing to do with the real world. Now Dirac, Dirac's equation had solutions that corresponded to the electron. But it had an another problem. It had solutions that you could think of as negative energy solutions that didn't seem to have to do with anything that we knew about. And so what, what were those negative energy solutions? Well, physicists are used to, to having equations, and there are physical solutions and there are non-physical solutions. 
So it was easy to say, well, this probably doesn't have it to do with anything. The equation just has these other solutions that don't have anything to do with the physical world. I don't think that's what Dirac believed. And then something surprising happened in the early 1930s, and that was the particles that corresponded to those other solutions were found in the cosmic rays. And those particles had what we say now opposite quantum numbers to the electron, but they had opposite charge, same mass, behaved very much the same way. And this was the first indication that what Dirac had really done, even though he didn't know it at the time, was he had come up with an equation that predicted the existence of antimatter, and antimatter showed up. So what happened in summary was Thomson, as you recall, discovered the electron in 1897. The proton, it's hard to give credit to anyone for discovering the proton. Maybe it's Rutherford when he discovered the nucleus. Uh, in the early 1930s, Chadwick discovered that there were neutral components in the nucleus. So now we're going fast and we're finding out that things deep down in the nucleus are getting a little more complicated. The positron showed up. People began to think about those forces I showed you and the exchange of particles and very uh, clever Japanese theorist, Yukawa, predicted that there was a particle that we needed to exchange to account for the strong force in the nucleus. And so he predicted that. And the next thing that showed up after he predicted it was the muon, which they thought originally was this particle, but then they saw that it didn't have the right properties, and it was nothing more than a heavy electron. So things are getting complicated. Nobody knew why we needed a heavy electron. And we got one whether we wanted it or not. The particle that Yukawa predicted showed up later in 1947 and accounted for the strong force, but not the strong force as we understand it today. Uh, we understand that this strong force was more like a Van der Waals force, if you know what that is. If you don't, it's, it's just a sort of a resultant force of the strong force. You'll learn about it later in physics. And then something else strange had happened way back in uh, 1930. When people were carefully studying beta decay, they discovered this problem that when a neutron decayed into an electron and a neutrino, uh, and you added up all the energies and momentum and so on, energy and momentum weren't conserved. And this was devastating because we had this conservation of energy law that we didn't want to give up because it seemed to throw everything into chaos. And we didn't know how to change the laws of physics to accommodate this. So in desperation, Pauli predicted that there was some little neutral particle that was escaping from that decay that we weren't detecting. He didn't like that solution because nobody knew how to detect that particle. And we've gotten into that situation a couple other times in physics. And you never, it's very unsatisfying to think that there's something that you, you can't see. People really tried hard to find it, but it took a long time. In 1956, in a nuclear reactor, Rhinus and Cowan finally detected the neutrino, and that's developed to the point where we now send a neutrino beam up to Minnesota uh, every few seconds when we're running our beam. So the neutrinos are relatively well understood now, and you'll learn a lot more of them in the lecture. So I've taken you to a point where a lot of things were showing up, and one of the things that I didn't mention were these strange particles. People looking at cosmic rays started noticing that there were these strange Vs in the cloud chambers and things, and they didn't seem to correspond to any of the known particles when you looked at the effective mass that they were and so on. So they kept looking for more and more of these things. They started building bigger accelerators, and the more accelerators they built at the universities and so on, the more of these odd particles they found to the point where chaos sort of reigned. There was a lot of confusion, and everybody had learned the trick of making the wavelength smaller, and so they thought the only way to get to the bottom of this is we've got to get together make a really big experiment, too big for to build at a university, and uh, 
big enough that university people could come here, do experiments, and maybe sort out this uh, confusing problem that was, was going on at the time. When this all happened, the, in the Soviet Union they had built a machine that was about uh, 70 billion electron volts, which was bigger than anything we had by a little more than a factor of two. And they were trying to do physics with it over there. We had to have a bigger one. So <laughs> it goes back to the thing about guys, you know. <laughs> so anyway, a group of universities got together, Universities Research Association, and contracted with what was the Atomic Energy Commission at the time, and they ended up hiring a director, Bob Wilson, who had worked with Lawrence at Berkeley, had worked on the Manhattan Project, and he was both a physicist and an artist. So you see his imprint on this laboratory in many ways, like this building and the arches you come through when you drive in, sculpture out front. Anyway, this is Wilson. He was our first director. He had been, he had grown up in Wyoming on a ranch. I have a really cool picture of him on a bareback on a bucking bronco. Uh, I'll have to put that in sometime. Anyway, he, I hate to admit it, but he was the director when I came here. And uh, so I've worked for all the directors so far. But anyway, he was a very interesting fellow. And he built the lab under budget and on time. And he's the one also responsible for these guys. Since he was a cowboy from Wyoming, he thought it would be nice if we had some buffalo. I like that because I grew up on a ranch in New Mexico, and I like buffalo too. This is what our accelerator complex looks like more or less these days. There are nine accelerators in the complex that do a couple of things. One thing is not shown on here. Uh, but we accelerate in stages. Some of you will walk past this area and see how this all happens today. And we accelerate in the LINAC here, AJUB booster, 120 or 150 JUB main injector, depending on what you're doing. Take beam out of the main injector, hit a target, make antiprotons, collect antimatter here, save it up, and eventually put it into the Tevatron, where it goes around this way, collides with matter coming the other way in these two big detectors, which aren't quite right here. Uh, this one's really over here. And, but this is what <laughs> public affairs does with these cool drawings. So that's the complex. Some of you, you will see this today. Some of you will sit next week. That's where it all starts. This is a very old fashioned 1930s Cockroft Walton generator. There's 750,000 volts between here and the wall. So you want to get yourself in between there. <laughs> Lightning frequently strikes across there. In fact, yesterday when I was showing your tour guide this device, uh, lightning was striking a couple of times. I don't like it when lightning strikes because it means it's not working right. <laughs> this is the Tevatron, and this is a superconducting accelerator, uh, the most powerful accelerator collider in the world right now. We do have competition coming online in Geneva, Switzerland, but we're going to get everything we can out of this before we turn off. This is the old main ring, and part of it is left in our tunnel. But this is the original machine that Wilson built. We use part of it now to transport beam out to the switchyard and part of it to, to transport protons down to where we inject them in, into an external line where we make the antiprotons. And this is what one of the big collider detectors looks like. They're very complicated, very big. Uh, we used to think these were the most humongous things in the world, but if you look at the, some of the pictures across the way of the big detectors being built at CERN, CMS and Atlas, uh, they're amazing. And to see them in person is even, it's awe-inspiring. People build such huge things. Anyway, this is a tracking chamber. What happens is the matter and the antimatter collide in the center here. And we've lost our good pictures. We need to put some in. But particles come streaming out. You can have one proton and one antiproton colliding, and 87 particles come flying out of there. And uh, leave tracks in this detector, go into these calorimeters where their energy is measured and things like that. And how do you get so much out of just two particles colliding? E equals mc squared, which was one of, one of the previous transparencies. There's a lot of kinetic energy. You can convert that into mass. And so all kinds of things come out of there. You can make very heavy top quarks, which are about 175 times as massive as the proton itself. And yet it's a component of the proton. 
only exists virtually in the proton. And hopefully Higgs particles and other things beyond our wildest dream come out of there. Here's how you make a top quark, what happens, and how you know you made it. Uh, what happens is because, because that wavelength is so short, you have direct quark-on-quark -quark collisions, and you can produce these things in pairs. They decay in a particular way. We can sort those decays out in our detectors and tell that we have them. This quark was, was discovered here. This is sort of our modern periodic table of the elements where we have listed six quarks that we know about, two discovered here at Kearney Lab, and then the leptons. There's the electron, the heavy electron I told you about, the muon, and the tau, and then they each have a neutrino associated with them. And over in this column are the force carriers that are like the photon that I showed you, and I also showed you a force with a W. So these are the ones we know. We know this picture is not complete. Uh, we suspect that there are other things that you'll learn about, like the Higgs particle. The biggest problem with this picture is something that I only alluded to briefly, and that's the dark matter. Because we know there's a lot of dark matter in the universe, we know that this apparently represents only about 5% of the universe. The rest of it's stuff we don't know. It's in this, we don't know what it is. It's in this room with us. I don't know about you, but I'm scared. <laughs> it's all around us, but we don't understand it. So that's where we're going at the laboratory. Uh, things that you will be touched on, not so much, all this theory, string theory, so on. We will be more practical in these lectures, but these other things uh, do exist. We're doing all these experiments to try and detect them. Fermi Lab's actively involved in two dark matter experiments. We're trying to understand something that I didn't talk to you very much about, but we understand that the universe is accelerating apart now due to something called the dark energy. What is that? I mentioned, at least to some of you, uh, something about string theory, but there's all kinds of reasons to suspect that space may be more complicated and time than we thought, and maybe that complication is hidden away in extra dimensions and so on. So the the world here is very interesting. I forgot to put this in the right order. I guess I'll explain this. I mentioned the neutrino beam going to, to Minnesota. We do make a neutrino beam here at Fermi Lab off the main injector. It goes under Wisconsin, improves the dairy output. <laughs> Minnesota, where there's a huge detector, and also where my dark matter detector that I used to work on is. And then uh, the neutrinos are detected and measured here, and when they get there, so we're studying uh, all about that. So, there are all these questions. I'm not going to go through these in detail because we're coming down to where I should be at the end of the lecture. You will get more on all of this part in the cosmology lecture, more details. Uh, You'll get some details about the structure of the universe and how it evolved over, over time as we understand it. it. Turns out that Fermi Lab is involved in uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And let me just skip ahead to show that. Part of the game here is we're trying to understand the universe from this hot big bang back at the beginning. And in the Tevatron, we create temperatures that go back to the order of a trillion to a second after the big bang. You can see what was happening with the quarks and the leptons there. And then this all somehow evolved into the structure that we see today. And to sort that out, one of the experiments we have done over the last few years, with a lot of universities of course, involves this telescope in New Mexico, Apache Point. This is one of our former directors. And this telescope has been very productive in cataloging and surveying the universe finding very distant objects, but more importantly to me, studying the structure and so that we can match it to our theories of how it came about. This is the dark matter detector CMS at Sudan. It was the most sensitive de uh, detector in the world until a few months ago, but uh, some xenon people took the record, but CMS is coming back. It works with little hockey puck type detectors that are cooled down to about 50 millikelvin, which is 
50 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. And placed at the bottom of this dark mine, this is a crystal. What you do with the crystal is you listen for the dark matter to interact in one of the nuclei in the crystal, sort of rattles the crystal and produces phonons, which come to the surface. surface. You measure those and the ionization, and you can get a background free detector. So, this is where we are. Uh, I won't go through this summary in detail, but I've asked a lot of questions. You guys have asked some questions. Try not to answer any of them. But we'll answer some of them in the next few lectures. But the point is there's still, there were some really big questions out there in front of us. And many of those questions are questions that some of you will have to come up with the answers with.